Hey, good morning, everybody. Hop on, get on. I'm back in my office, Jamestown, North Dakota. Pastor Sean coming to you live with the God's holy word, praying that it blesses you and touches your spirit and soul. We believe that God's word is from God and perfect. It is to be interpreted through the lens of scripture. And we are coming to you this morning with the word of God, praying the Holy Spirit inspires and blesses. Good morning, Lori Hagen. And there's my mother faithfully hopping on. Good to see you two ladies. Hey, Rena, nice to see you. How are you today? So good to have all of my folks getting on early. <clears throat> I've got a fun one today. And then we're gearing up for uh, good morning. Rena, uh, we're gearing up for, for tomorrow's Friday already. Ooh, where did the week go? Had a busy day yesterday. I did some marriage counseling for a young couple getting married. I was with them for five hours. Woo, need a caribou on that one. We did go to caribou. I took them out to eat, went to caribou. I think it'll be a blessing for them, God willing. So anyway, today we're in John chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, which I always encourage you to do, have your Bibles, have your highlighters, get into the Word. Let's do that right now, if you will. Good morning, Brother Daryl. How are you today? Greet your dear wife. There's Mary Pat. Good to see you. Greet your wonderful husband. Hello, everybody. Hop on, get on. Let's get into the Word here. Reading in Jesus' name, John 8. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where, they, where all the people gathered around him. He sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, uh, it commands us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus. But Jesus bent down and he started writing on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, let anyone of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and started writing on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older one first until Jesus went away with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Gotta love her response. No one, sir, she said. And this is the best response of all. And Jesus said, then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. I want to talk to you a little bit today about sometimes you look back on your life, you look back on your past, and you think of some of the things you've done, and you feel like this woman that's been thrown on the ground in front of Jesus. And you wonder, could Jesus ever forgive my past? Could he ever forgive the way I've conducted myself, my inappropriate actions? How could God forgive me? You sit and you wrestle with, with all of the, the things that have worked through your mind, the things that you, you condemn yourself for even now, things that happened 30, 40, 50 years ago and you can't let it go. You wonder, is sex outside of marriage acceptable? Is it sinful? 
If it is sinful, could I ever have any hope of getting into heaven? If it is, uh, what should my attitude be with those who are guilty of this sexual sin and what should my attitude be towards myself? This debate about sexual ethics, it continues. It's permeating our media. It's not just with heterosexual sin, it's with homosexual sin, it's with the LGBT community. It's everywhere you turn. The teaching of Jesus 2,000 years ago is just as relevant then as it is today. Or should I say, it's just as relevant today as it was then. The words of Jesus were the greatest words, I believe, dealing with sexual sin ever spoken. The kind of words that you would expect God to speak, the temple guards declared, no one has ever spoke the way that this man does. In John chapter 7, verse 46, it is so sad that some religious leaders fail to recognize Jesus. They regard him as uh, one who would uh, be led of Beelzebub. You remember last week I talked about how Jesus said a house divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus spoke for the Lord because he came from God. Talked about that here this last week. This woman is caught in the act of adultery. She must have felt absolute despair. She must have felt absolutely desperate because the law of Moses declared that she should be stoned. Have you ever felt that kind of despair? Despair that, that floods your soul, floods your mind, it beats you down, it declares you so guilty, you have nowhere to turn, nowhere to run, Despair can come from defeat. It can come from, from no hope, from, from a place where you know you're guilty, that, that, that you wish you could be innocent, but you can't. You can't find that hope. Despair can come from moral failures, which every human being seems to have some kind of moral failure in some way or shape, form, or, or, or fashion. She had to be experiencing both kinds of, of failures, filled with guilt and shame, fear of death. How sickening it was for her to lay on the ground in front of these people, feeling worthless and hopeless, feeling sickened that she had been caught. Those that were condemning her tried to trap Jesus with a question in chapter 8, verse 6. Jesus gives one of the most brilliant, most memorable, quoted lines. I think in all of scripture, in all of history, it's been used many times. Have you ever heard this one before? Let he who is without sin be the first to throw the first stone at her. Can you imagine? Let he who is without sin examine yourself. Think about it. <clears throat> These men wanted to kill her. They wanted to trap Jesus. They wanted to make sure that he would have absolutely no way to wiggle out of this one so that they could literally kill him. They were sick of Jesus and his righteousness. So what did they do when Jesus responded after writing in the sand with his finger? Well, Jesus did not condone her adultery, nor did he regard it as the unforgivable sin. He demonstrated how easy it is to condemn others while they, being guilty of the same sin in their own hearts, verses 7 through 9, stand with a stone in their hand, a judgmental spirit wanting to condemn the very people, the very person that they themselves are. 
This can be applied to many areas of your life and my life before we criticize others. It is always worth asking ourselves whether we are without sin and in that area we are uh, needing to be very cautious and very careful not to criticize one another because it's where you want to go. We as Christians, when we're not walking around in pure defeat and shame and guilt, we walk around with stones in our hands looking for someone to condemn. We judge, we accuse, we condemn, we, 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 we project on, on people that, that seem to not have it as well as we do, seem to be screwing up on a continuous basis. We project on them that we refuse to see their sin in us. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? You know, it is said, it is often said that people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. You know why? Because when you throw a stone in a glass house, it tends to break the glass. We need to be cautious when we start throwing the stones in the context of the debate about the sexual ethics as we look at our own hearts there's often a lot of glass around us that is already broken and more glass to be broken when we're ready to cast the first stone. So what do we do with a sexually deviant country which we live in? Well, the account of the woman caught in adultery, we know what happened to each of her condemners, those who are standing with rocks in their hands. Each of the condemner is convicted by Jesus' own words Until eventually they hear a drop, click, drop, boom, boom, boom. The rocks are hitting the ground and Jesus looks up, verses 7 through 9. And he asks the woman, has no one condemned you in verse 10? And when she replied, no one, sir, then he said, then neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin, verse 11. My dear friends, guilt is a horrible emotion, but guilt can be used of God to set you free. Sometimes the horrific terror in your conscience, the the, the condemnation that is so terrible, it's a terrible state to be in. But how amazing it is to hear those words from God himself when you feel the terror and the weight and the shame of your sin To hear those words, then neither do I condemn you. Verse 11, and since he was without sin, Jesus, the one person who is in the position to throw the stone, declares to her, you are forgiven. She didn't even ask. She didn't even confess it with her mouth and believe in her heart yet. She was just shame and guilt laying on the ground wishing nothing could happen. How could this happen? Listen, the beauty of how God works is when he declares you are forgiven, he speaks faith into your dead, lifeless spirit and soul soaked in sin and shame and guilt like this woman caught in adultery, feeling as if there's nowhere for me to turn, wishing you could shove those memories from the past in a closet and never to open them again, But sometimes, somewhere, somehow, the old devil in your past creeps up and you are reminded of the sickness that once uh, uh, had you so deep in the trenches and you're right back there again. And Jesus declares, neither do I condemn you. And when he declared that to this woman, his spoken words of forgiveness created, not enabled, created faith in this woman to stand up and to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ as the true Son of God, the sacrifice, the propitiation for all of her sins. How did it happen? Did she get all of that? Could she put that theological picture together? No way, no how. She couldn't get it. She didn't understand it. All she knew was she heard herself forgiven. There is a an extraordinary balance 
an almost unique combination in the words of Jesus, full of wisdom and grace, mercy and compassion. Jesus could not be clear that the adultery that she was caught in was and is sin. You can not have sex outside of holy matrimony. Period. Yet, he does not condemn her in any way. What do, you, what do you mean? What do you mean, Pastor Sean? Well, this is the message of the New Testament. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. He <coughs> allowed her to experience his presence, his washing with the word. His word created faith. She stood up and she believed that's how God's word works. It speaks life into you. And as a result of Jesus' death on the cross, you and I can be totally forgiven. However far you've fallen away from the things of, of God and grace, my dear friends, today, God would say to you, even if you're not, if you're sitting here listening to me right now, right now, and you haven't confessed, you haven't come to God, you haven't, you haven't responded in any way to the things of God, but you're listening, wondering to yourself, is there a God? My friend, Jesus, who is God, is bending down, writing in the sand with his finger, and he's thinking about your shame and guilt and sin, the very sin that you have been condemning yourself for for years and years and years, and Jesus is declaring, right now, right now, where are they that were going to throw the stones at you? And you look around and you say, they're gone, Lord. And he says, then you are forgiven. I do not condemn you of your sin no more. My dear friends, no matter how far you've fallen, Jesus declares, you are forgiven. Now, this is not a reason to go on sinning. This is not what Jesus means. Jesus does not condone her sin. He's saying, leave your life of sin, verse 11. Jesus does not condemn us. He forgives us. And then he says to us, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. How do you become fishers of men? Well, have you ever went fishing before? Yes or no? Did you ever dig up any uh, night crawlers? Yes. Put them in a little pail? Yes. You got to your fishing hole, you put your hook on, got your little bobber on, what'd you do? You dug in your pail, you put on the biggest, fattest, juiciest earthworm you had, your little, your, your little uh, night crawler, you throw it in the water, you wait for some hungry fish to come and take a bite of that big old night crawler, right? Right? You remember. What's the bait? What's the night crawler you can put on the, the Jesus hook to, to draw sinners into the cross of Christ? Here's the bait. It's the very sin that you've been forgiven of. That's your big juicy night crawler. Use the sin which you have been forgiven of to tell others about the forgiveness of God. Jesus' words will always motivate when, he, when people hear in the declaration that they are forgiven because of his love and compassion. This is the example that God gives. It's easy to follow. It's easy to, 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 to hear these words and to declare that I believe I'm forgiven because Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. You are not condemned. Leave your life a sin. Come, let's follow Jesus together. Let's live in his grace. You see, Jesus' words, they motivate me. Don't they motivate you? Doesn't his love and compassion make it easy for us to follow this example? It's easy to fall into, uh, into one of the two opposite extremes. Either we condemn people or we condone sin. You know people that are living like this. They're either walking around condemning everyone they see or they're, they're condoning all sin, saying it's all okay. Love does not condemn and love does not condone sin because sin leads to people getting hurt. And so God 
gives his love, pours his love into you. And if we love like Jesus, we will neither condone sin nor will we condemn people. <clears throat> we will lovingly speak his words of life to them. We will lovingly call people to the cross and ask them to repent with us. We will lovingly reach into our little pail, grab the big old night crawler of, the, grab the bait, put it on hook. The bait is the sin that you've been forgiven of. <clears throat> people can connect with your sin. They can. If, if, if you really believe you are forgiven, the best way to draw others around you into the cross of Christ is to expose. Don't make yourself look like you're better than you really are. Use that which you've been given by God, even the things that you were once ashamed of, to draw people into the cross. You see, if we love like Jesus, we will neither condone sin nor condemn people. But lovingly, we'll challenge people to leave their sin behind. That Greek word to forgive also means, get this, the Greek word to forgive also means to liberate. Jesus came to liberate you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And you are called to liberate others by the power of the Holy Ghost who lives in you. You are liberated to love as God loves you. Forgiveness is at the heart of of God and forgiveness lives in your heart and forgiveness is at the heart of every relationship that you'll ever have. My dear friends, Jesus has been writing in the sand declaring to you that neither do I condemn you. So now you get to go out with the essence of God's love declaring people are forgiven in Christ because he is declaring it through your forgiveness. Do you believe this? If you do, say amen. Amen and amen because this is the grace of God, the love of God. Hit share, hit like. Let's get people onto this site. Let's get people listening to this message. People need to be set free by the powerful love and the blood of Jesus because we live in a culture that's bound in wicked sexual sin that should not have any place in our life. Let us find the love of God and declare it to people who need the mercy. Now, God is calling you to go. Use the bait. Put it on the hook. Become fishermen of men. Amen. Father God, in Jesus' name, anoint your hearers with the greatness of God to go forth in the love of Jesus. Amen. And I'm in. Caribou coffee. Love it. I'm glad you joined me today. Oli, bless you. Mary Pat, have a great day. Rena, welcome back. So good to see you. Bless you, bless you, bless you. There's Sherry Severson. Where are you staying? Where are you? Where are you staying? What do you mean? Where am I staying? I'm staying in my house in Jamestown. Where are you staying, Sherry? <laughs> Got me crazy here. Amen, church. Please don't judge me and my family. Uh, but ever since my husband. Who is this? Oh, I got to read that. Good to have you, Connie Berg. Nancy, good to have you. Holy bless you, Victoria. Amen, church. Please don't judge me and my family. But ever since my husband lost his job due to the pandemic, it it's a... It's, let's see, what's it say? Husband lost a uh, Could you please say a miracle prayer for me and my family? Ask God to put the right people before us and help us in any way possible. We are short $24 of being able to extend her. Ah, uh, da, 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 da. Where do you live, Victoria Miller? Where do you live? Oli, good to have you today. Victoria, you get a hold of me by messenger. We've got ways of helping people and we do help people. But we also ask lots of questions because we want to help people that are really in need. And sometimes we have to talk to people. 
Nancy, good to have you. Good to have you, Melinda Lux. Good to have you, dear mother. Mary Pat, Rena. Who else do we have? Daryl Lozen, God bless you guys. God bless all you guys. Lori Hagen, it's been good to have you today. Bless you. See you tomorrow, Friday. God bless.